all of you um, and welcome to the uh, inaugural lecture of this year's Interdisciplinary Humanities Center series, The Humanities and the Brain. My name is Susan Derwin and I am the director of the IHC. It's really wonderful to see everybody here today and I hope that you will continue to join us at the many events we have scheduled throughout the year. I can think of no better way to inaugurate a series on the humanities and the brain than with a lecture on ecstasy. This extraordinary state of being, which involves both the mind and the body, has for ages captured the imaginations of poets, artists, dramatists, philosophers, and students of scripture. The words etymology may provide the first cue as to why. Ecstasy, from the Greek ecstasis, meaning removal from the proper place, is an experience of displacement. To be ecstatic is to be out of place, and also to be driven out of one's mind. Ecstasy, then, as an experience of psychic border crossings, can verge on insanity. In entering this state, the ecstatic subject is always in danger of speaking a language that others cannot understand, of losing a proper place within the symbolic order. That is why ecstasy is closely tied to transgression, destruction, and abandonment, and also why representing ecstasy poses such a challenge. And yet, even though ecstasy is a phenomenon of dislocation, it is also linked to transcendence, creativity, and the birth of new forms. It is in the spirit of dislocation and constructive transformation that the IHC is mounting the Humanities and the Brain series. The speakers who are set to take part in the series are themselves engaged in creative displacements of the discourses and approaches that characterize their respective disciplines. Throughout the year, they will explore the workings and productions of the mind in their discussions of topics ranging from cognitive science and Buddhist philosophy to the neuroscience of aesthetics. And I hope that you will join us next Thursday as well at 4 p.m. when Professor Rebecca Seligman of Northwestern University will speak on conditions of the brain, meaning, metaphor, and mechanism in illness and healing. Professor Ann Taves is the ideal person to inaugurate this year's interdisciplinary explorations. She holds the Virgil Cardano OFM Endowed Chair in Catholic Studies in UCSB's Religious Studies Department, and previously she was a faculty member in the Claremont School of Theology and at Claremont Graduate University. Anne's work centers on American religious history, the history of Christianity in the modern era, and the history of the scientific study of religion, psychology, and related phenomena. It draws upon classic social theory and evolutionary and developmental approaches to the study of human behavior to examine events and experiences that inhabit what Anne has described as, quote, the indeterminate space between imagination and reality, craziness and inspiration, fiction and faith. Anne's many publications include the award-winning monographs, The Household of Faith, Roman Catholic Devotions in Mid-19th Century America, Fits, Trances, and Visions, Experiencing Religion and Explaining Experience from Wesley to James, and Religious Experience Reconsidered, a building block approach to the study of religion and other special things, as well as two collected volumes and numerous articles and book chapters. Her current research project looks at the role that unusual experience plays in the earliest stages of A Course in Miracles, Mormonism, and Alcoholics Anonymous. And she's happy to explain if you want to speak to her after the talk. <laughs> Anne is deeply committed to fostering new approaches to comparative religious studies that bridge the humanities and the neurosciences. To this end, she established the Interdepartmental Research Group on Religion, Experience, and Mind, which draws faculty, researchers, and students from religious studies, psychology, anthropology, and other disciplines. And she is a board member of UCSB's SAGE Center for the Study of the Mind. 
It is my delight and privilege to introduce Professor Ann Taves to deliver her talk entitled Ecstasy, Linking the Humanities and the Brain. Thank you. Well, thank you, Susan, for that introduction. And I have to admit, I, I also need to thank you for inviting me to speak on the topic of ecstasy. Um, it was kind of Susan's idea, the specific topic. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I decided it really does, I think, provide an ideal point of entree um, into this theme of humanities and the brain. Um, ideal not because the way is straightforward, but ideal because it's not an obscure topic. It's something that we all at least have some knowledge about, if not direct experience of. And at the same time, as we're going to see, it's this highly multifaceted concept. And as such, it illustrates, I think, many of the problems that we link in connecting or linking the humanities and the brain. So I'm going to use ecstasy today as a case study to illustrate the difficulties involved in linking a complex cultural concept um, of the sort that we study in the humanities, concepts such as ecstasy, but also religion, the sacred, and even the self. Connecting these kinds of complex concepts to underlying mental processes, and then beyond that, uh, linking mental processes with the neurological or brain processes that underlie them. So I'm not going to work my way all through all those levels, but what I'm going to try and demonstrate with ecstasy is some of the steps that we need to go through to make the kind of work that we do so much of in the humanities actually something that could be researched by psychologists or neurologists. So to give you a quick overview of the problem, I'll go to where Susan took us in the introduction, which is back to the Greek use of the term ecstasis. And if we go to the Oxford English Dictionary, there's a little comment before they start in on the definitions. And here's the comment. The classical senses of ecstasis are insanity and bewilderment. But in late Greek usage, that is in the late Greek classical period, the etymological meaning received another application. That is, quote, withdrawal of the soul from the body, mystic or prophetic trance. That's a little quote within the comment. Hence, the comment continues, in later medical writers, the word is used for trance, etc., generally. Both the classical and post-classical senses, the comment says, come into modern languages, and in the present figurative uses, they seem to be blended. The OBD, after giving this introduction, then offers eight different definitions of the word, clustered under five headings. And I've inserted some of the headings based on the content, so that we have an etymological definition, pathological, religious, affective, and as of 1992, pharmacological. You don't need to worry about the details too much yet, because I'm going to be coming back to this slide. For the moment, I just want to highlight that our first problem is one of definition. So scholars and the general public use the concept to characterize a vast range of subjective experiences and observable behaviors. In light of this range, what counts as ecstatic is typically a matter of dispute or debate. But our difficulties don't end there. As the different definitional clusters that I just showed you suggest, people generally embed the concept of ecstasy implicitly or explicitly in an understanding of how the mind works. These frameworks, which range from everyday common sense psychology to highly refined philosophical or scientific understandings, are often hard to reconcile with one another in part due to the wider set of claims regarding the source and meaning of these experiences 
accepted within particular communities, traditions, or disciplines. These wider claims, of course, are also a matter of dispute, of dispute or debate. Given these problems, studying ecstasy, or more precisely, studying experiences that people characterize as ecstatic, requires us to engage with issues of methodology. In order to forge links between the humanities and the psychological and brain sciences, I will argue that we need to identify features that are often associated with ecstasy at the cultural level. These will include various kinds of alterations of self, alterations of perception, and alterations of emotion. These features taken together won't amount to a definition of ecstasy, since the features, as we will see, may contradict one another, as in the case of movement, or lack of movement, or strong emotion, or lack of emotion, which are each of these being featured in different definitions. Moreover, these different features can combine in numerous different configurations and appear under different names, such as mysticism, shamanism, spirit possession, intoxication, hysteria, and mania, to name just some of them. So my main point will be that we cannot uniquely specify ecstasy or even ecstasies at the cultural level that we study it as humanists. But we can identify features that people often associate with ecstasy and then begin to specify particular features in precise enough terms that they can be studied psychologically and eventually neurologically. So in order to be as clear as I can about what such an approach would, in, would entail, I want to contrast the approach that I'm taking with that, with an approach taken by a 19th century French Jesuit, Father Augustin Francois Poulon, lived from 1836 to 1919, is the author of a handbook of mystical theology, which was originally published in French in 1901 and translated into English in 1910 as the graces of prayer. I do this not to privilege Catholicism, though it certainly has been a major stakeholder in these discussions of ecstasy, but because Poulin's synthetic treatment of Catholic <coughs> mystical theology devoted extensive space to the concept of ecstasy at a time when Catholic accounts of ecstatic experience were being investigated and theorized from multiple directions, many of them highly dismissive. Although these debates, which included theologians, philosophers, psychologists, and neurologists, were centered in France, where they focused primarily on Catholic claims, they extended well beyond France feeding into wider discussions of philosophy, the comparative study of religions, anthropology, psychology, and clinical medicine that have resonated down to the present. Poulin explicitly engaged these debates, along with the history of Catholic thought on these matters, in an effort to more precisely specify the meaning of true ecstasy in his own interdisciplinary and highly polemical context. Doing so forced him to struggle, and he did so openly and honestly, with the methodological difficulties surrounding the concept, and thus with the problems that I just identified. Nonetheless, in light of our respective standpoints and aims, Poulin and I approach these problems differently. So, first of all, First difference, Poulin approached ecstasy as a Catholic practical theologian who was struggling with interdisciplinary challenges that were thrust upon him. In contrast, I approach ecstasy having been drawn into an interdisciplinary space between the humanities and the sciences some 25 years ago through my research on the debates over unusual experiences in 18th and 19th century Europe and America. I come at this topic as an advocate of interdisciplinarity, not just within the humanities, but also between the humanities and the sciences. Second, Poulin attempted to preserve an understanding of, of true ecstasy 
based on a close reading of the writings of and about the saints of the Catholic mystical tradition. In contrast, I'm not trying to define ecstasy. I think it is a complex cultural concept that is an abstract noun with unstable, culturally determined beings that vary between lines of academic research as well as between religious, spiritual, and healing traditions. Moreover, these meanings overlap in unpredictable ways with various related concepts, such as mysticism, shamanism, possession, and so forth. So my interest is in unusual experiences more generally, the way people appraise them, uh, both consciously and unconsciously, both during the experience and after the fact, the mechanisms underlying these processes, and the way that people discover and elaborate their meaning. So in the remainder of this talk, I want to focus on what I'm collapsing into two problem areas to illustrate the problems and to be more specific about how I think we ought to approach them. So I will start with the definitional problem and then turn to uh, clashing psychologies. So as you probably, as you probably already gathered, Poulin's primary object of study was Catholic mysticism, not ecstasy. His aim was to use the scientific historical methods of his day to produce a systematic description of the process of mystical union derived from two sets of sources. The first, classical and approved Catholic writers, and second, reports that experienced Catholic spiritual directors were gathering from living persons. Relying heavily, however, on the writings of St. Teresa of Avila, he located ecstasy as the third of the four stages in this process, just prior to its culmination in the spiritual marriage between the soul and Christ. Poulain defined ecstasy, in other words, in the context of an overall defense of the possibility of mystical union with God. His definition, which has two elements, the alienation of the senses and intense attention to some religious object matches the OED definition uh, number 3A, which I've highlighted in yellow, quite closely. What I find most interesting, or particularly interesting, however, is that Poulin used his definition to distinguish supernatural ecstasy from what he referred to as various counterfeits of ecstasy. And these are also represented in the OED definitions. These alternative definitions included hypnotic ecstasy and hysterical ecstasy, which was studied by the, quote, medical men of his day, such as Jean-Martin Charcot and Pierre Genet. And you can see that, their definition, in number two but also uh, natural somnambulism, or trance states, as discussed by the psychologist Theodore Flournois in his famous study published in 1900 of the Swiss medium Helene Smith, which corresponds with definition 3B. We also discussed as a counterfeit form of ecstasy the illuminations and reveries produced by drugs, not MDNA, but alcohol, ether, chloroform, hashish, opium, morphine, and nitrous oxide, as discussed by psychologist Joseph Jastro in his book on the subconscious, and William James in his chapter on the varieties of religious experience. So this corresponds down here with number five. And then finally, he also discussed swooning, which he indicated some Catholic theologians mistakenly viewed as a special kind of ecstasy, and which we can find up there in number 2A. He went on, though, in the course of the book, to also offer brief descriptions of the pseudo-ecstasy of Muslims and the untutored ecstasy of Protestant revivalists, untutored because, in his view, insufficiently informed by Catholic tradition, and he concluded that he could find no good historical evidence, even among the yogis of India, as he called them, and thus, of course, another counterfeit ecstasy, 
to prove the existence of true ecstasy outside the Catholic tradition. Okay, so another interesting thing I discovered in my researching ecstasy then and now. His, false, his list of false ecstasies not only maps onto the OED definition, but the range of definitions, but also onto the range of definitions that we see in scholarly and popular writing today. So if we search under ecstasy in the medical and psychological databases, we find a huge literature on MDNA, the drug popularly known as ecstasy, as well as studies that refer to ecstasy in the context of research on epileptic auras and uh, high-end studies of Buddhist contemplative practices, high-end in the sense of with expert practitioners who go through a stage that the research was describing as instead. If we research on Amazon, the number and range of publications expands dramatically. Some are academic, but I have to say trashy novels Self-help books in popular spirituality dominate. And here's a sampling, having deleted all the trashy novels. <laughs> if we, you know, if we peruse the popular literature, uh, we find that in addition to Catholic and evangelical Protestant ecstasy, today we have offerings on varieties of Jewish, Hindu, Islamic, Buddhist, and New Age ecstasies. Not just one kind, but some kinds between, within each of these. On one hand, and then we have titles connecting ecstasy with sexuality, birth, death, pain, creativity, dance, and nature on the other. Okay, so that's the sort of popular spirituality self-help type stuff. If we focus in on academic research, we find that certain disciplines have had a particular interest in the concept, including religious studies, anthropology, philosophy, the arts, under which I would include literature, drama, dance, and music, as well as medicine and psychiatry. But each has its own related set of concepts, except that blur in with it. Um, so let me introduce you to the definitions in three classic works on ecstasy among academics. The first is anthropologist I. M. Lewis's, uh, oh, wait a minute, let me, first is anthropologist I. M. Lewis's ecstatic religion. Second is historian of religion, Mercia Eliade's shamanism, archaic techniques of ecstasy. And the third is Nietzsche's birth of tragedy. In each of these, we find different definitions, definitions that differ from each other, and definitions that differ from Kulaks. So, with Ian Lewis, his ecstatic religion is devoted to what anthropologists refer to as typically as spirit possession, in which a spirit displaces the self and acts through the body of the possessed per person. In that regard, it continues the definitional tradition represented by psychologist Theodore Fournois study of the medium Helene Smith. Mercia Eliade, by way of contrast, focuses on trans experiences in which the <coughs> common soul is believed to, believed to leave his body, where Lewis and Eliade both focus on the individual's interaction with spirits, albeit in different ways. Nietzsche focused on experiences in which divisions between humans and this is a quote, give way to an overwhelming feeling of unity. Nietzsche grounded ecstasy, and this is from the introduction, in the dancing and music making of a frenzied chorus in the grip of Dionysian intoxication. And you, to quote Nietzsche, art, parentheses, not the shaman, as a saving sorceress with the power to heal. This idea of collective Dionysian ecstasy developed by Nietzsche and later reinforced by Emile Durkheim's notion of collective effervescence is notably absent in Poulin's work, which predates Durkheim but not Nietzsche. Heidegger took up the tradition of Dionysian ecstasy in, in his analysis of ecstatic temporality, as did Bataille in his meditations on negative ecstasy. 
the Dionysian line of interpretation also formed the backdrop for the hallucinogenic art exhibit titled Ecstasy in and About Altered State at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles in 2006. And the contemporary ecstatic dance movement in the US and Europe rejects the use of drugs, but implicitly echoes Durkheim's idea of collective effervescence in its emphasis on shaman DJs and modern tribalism on the dance floor. But we have one last definitional cluster, which is those who define ecstasy in relation to emotion. The problem here is that they don't agree on whether it's the feeling of intense emotion that's the defining feature, or the transcendence of intense emotion, that is, the absence of emotion. Thus, in a wide-ranging discussion of the contemporary hunger for ecstasy, clinical psychologist Sharon Farber defines ecstasy not in terms of emotion, but in terms of the displacement of the self, or in psychological terms, dissociation that leads to a transcendence of emotion. Like Bataille, she focuses on negative ecstasy and the role of pain, trauma, and intense emotion in triggering the escape from emotion. In contrast, others define ecstasy in terms of intense emotion. In a recent article, psychologist Ralph Hood contrasts the ecstatic emotional arousal of Protestant revivals with the calm emotional states that he, like Poulin, associates with the mystical traditions. Then we have two South Asianists uh, weighing in, Balinar and Basu, who simply characterize the emotional state they associate with emotion as intense. But like Poulin, and in contrast to I am Lewis, they stipulate that subjects must remain aware. Still, Malinar and Basu concede what I hope is now becoming obvious. Well, ecstasy has now become an umbrella term that seems to cover too many phenomena to allow a definition. So, here we are, kind of in the humanities. Um, how do we respond to this overabundance of definitions? Well, scholars in the humanities might respond much as Poulin did by stipulating a definition of ecstasy and then locating themselves in relation to one or more of these lines of theory and reflection. I don't think that's the most effective way to bridge to the sciences. A more effective route would be to sort through the range of phenomena, pay more attention to the descriptions of the experiences than the labels with which they're characterized. Now, one of the interesting things that I discovered in going through Poulin was that in his desire to work with accounts of experiences, Poulin confronted the confusion created by the conflation of experiences and the appraisals that people make of them, even within his relatively limited selection of Catholic sources. In retrospect, he said, much time would have been saved in extracting what he referred to as the facts of experience. If Catholic theologians had distinguished between the state in question and the label ascribed to it. And here, in his words, is how he says they should have thought about it. They, meaning the Catholic theologians, were trying to collect their evidence. He said, we should have begun by saying, do we admit the existence of such a state described in such or such terms? Without concerning ourselves with knowing if we should call it mystic or give it such or such a classical name, we will call it, he says, the end state, provisional. It will often be found that we are of the same mind, meaning we Catholic theologians, as to the existence of this state. The divergence consists only in the choice of a label that is to be applied to end. And then he says something that I think is really important. This separation of the description and the terminology 
will show us that many of the old writers have described the same things under different names, or on the other hand, different things under the same names. End of quote. So the first step that I'm going to suggest in converting unstable cultural concepts into experiences that we can study scientifically is to distinguish as far as possible between the phenomenological shape of the experience and the way that it is consciously appraised or labeled. I think we can go a step further, however, if we treat stipulated definitions of experiential phenomena, such as ecstasy, mysticism, or trance, as at once as simultaneously identifying and appraising a type of experience. If, as Poulin suggests, we ignore how the experience is so specified or labeled, we can simply focus on the types of experiences identified and subject them to further scrutiny. In this case, we can use the diverse definitions of ecstasy as a means of identifying the elements that sometimes come together in patterns that people sometimes characterize as ecstatic. When we focus on these elements or components, however, we're no longer talking about varieties of ecstasy. Our focus has shifted down a level to building blocks of experience that some have chosen when they come together in certain combinations as ecstatic. So I worked through a whole bunch of these definitions that I gathered up, and based on analyzing them, um, here's what I came up with. So you see there, on the left, the three basic categories that seem to come up regularly in talking in different kinds of uh, definitions of ecstasy. So I would identify alterations in the sense of self as the most fundamental component. But as we've seen, these alterations take a wide variety of forms. And everything in that second box is what somebody described as one of the different forms. And each of those forms can combine with various alterations of ordinary perception, which you see down here in the, this row. And they can also then combine with alterations at, of affect or emotion. Now, making a chart like this, breaking things down in this way, I think gets us closer to things that psychologists and neuroscience scientists can begin to recognize. But I think that the links are still pretty tenuous. This category here, alterations in sense of self, is problematic because self is itself a complex cultural concept. And as there's a new handbook of the self out that's put together by philosophers and psychologists and neuroscientists, and in one of the art lead articles there, Vogelie and Gallagher point out that, quote, it is a category mistake to start looking around for selves in the brain. OK, so point here is we still have more work to do. To forge stronger links, we need to focus in on particular features and specify them more precisely. So if we go back to Poulin's definition of his notion of true ecstasy, that would include certain of the features on this chart. It would include alienation of the bodily senses and lack of movement. It would also catch up meditation or contemplative prayer. And it would also include new modes of perception. So I'm going to use these components and particularly the alienation of the senses and, and the new modes of perception um, to illustrate our second problem area, the different psychologies, ancient and modern, in which concepts of ecstasy are typically embedded in the wider claims that people make regarding the source and meaning of experiences they characterize as ecstatic. So this takes us into part two, classroom psychologists. 
Now, we could take up this topic in any context where an indigenous or traditional or philosophical understanding of the mind competes with a contemporary experimental approach. But to keep this discussion focused, as I said, I'm returning to Poulin's uh, definition and particularly to his response to the medical men of his day. The problem for Poulin was, as you can note here, as of 1866, the medical men adopted a new definition of ecstasy, which was actually very close to the one he espoused, and not only characterized ecstasy as hallucinatory, but also used it to re-describe Catholic mysticism as pathological. So the clinicians at the Saul Petrier Hospital in Paris, which is where uh, Charcot taught, were particularly notorious in this regard. And this is a very famous picture from the Saul Petrier, and that is a, what they describe as a hysteric. And I put the famous picture <coughs> of Teresa next to the picture of the hysteric. And they were really into juxtaposing these kinds of pictures. Okay, but Poulin took these medical men on, noting, quote, most of the doctors who occupy themselves with religious psychology are mental specialists. Being constantly with persons suffering from hallucinations, they are inclined to identify anyone whose state of mind is exceptional with those suffering from hallucinations. They are fond of busying themselves with mysticism instead of leaving this study to theologians. They see in it an extension of their own special subject, meaning mental illness. Since the clinicians often simply equated the states that Poulin considered mystical with hallucinations, his strategy was to demonstrate that they differed. He acknowledged that both true and false ecstasy could involve intensely focused attention. But in the pathological cases, he claimed, the nature of the focused attention was different. The differences, he said, were twofold. First, during true ecstasy, the intellectual faculty grows, while in false ecstasy of the neuropathic patients, it contracts. Second, he said, the hallucinations under observation in the hospitals always consist of representations of the imagination. We're going to come back to that phrase. They are, he said, visual or oral, A-U-R-A-L, or tactile, and are therefore very different from the purely intellectual perceptions that are generally found in the saints. The first difference that he noted, we can call the fruits of the spirit test, fruits of the spirit test, which remains a staple of spiritual discernment practices down to the present. But that has to do with how the person behaves after the experience. The second difference is more relevant here because it concerns the phenomenology of the experience itself. In advancing this as a basis for differentiating mystical and hallucinatory states, Poulin drew on, uh, on Augustine's distinction between corporeal, imaginative, and intellectual visions. The three types of visions form a ranked hierarchy with the corporeal or bodily vision being the one that relies on the bodily senses and, was, uh, and con was considered the least reliable at the bottom of the hierarchy. The imaginative vision, which relied on images that could be generated in the absence of sensory input, was considered more reliable, that fell in the middle, and the intellectual vision which was non-representational, uh, non was at the top and considered the most reliable. But it's interesting to think about how Augustine's three types of visions overlap with a modern psychological definition of hallucinations. This is a typical psychological definition, which is a little more generous in some ways or positive than a psychiatric definition, which defines hallucinations as a sensory experience which occurs in the absence of a corresponding external stimulation of the relevant sensory organ 
has a sufficient sense of reality to resemble a veridical discussion over which the subject does not feel that she or he has direct and voluntary control and which occurs in the awake state. Okay, intellectual visions, insofar as they do not involve sensory experience of any sort, are not hallucinations. Imaginative visions, which occur while awake, would fit this definition of a hallucination. But those that occur while asleep, which according to Augustine were the most common kind, would not. And just notice, actually, how the which occurs in the awake state is kind of tacked on to this definition. That's one of my favorite features of it. Um, they got to tack it on, or else we'll think that this might be more normal. Okay. Glenn's dis distinction between imaginative and purely intellectual perceptions thus rested on the claim that it was possible for some to gain a, non a direct, non-representational understanding of ultimate truths. According to Glenn, skeptics rejected his claim, or this claim, which had been going on for a long time, wasn't it? And as a result, either deny the experiences reported by the mystics a priori, or in Kulan's words, whittle them down and change them in order to make them more easy of explanation. This clash of psychologies, traditional and modern, led to an impasse, a general parting of the ways between psychology and the study of Christian mystical experience that, as historian Bernard McGinn has noted, has continued to some degree down to the present. I think we can break through this impasse, at least as it relates to this talk, by taking two further steps. The first is to use discussions of different kinds of experiences, such as Augustine's distinction between the types of visions, to specify as precisely as we can the alleged phenomenological distinctions between different experiences, in this case, imaginative and intellectual visions. From Poulain, building on Augustine, we learn that neither imaginative nor intellectual visions involve direct sensory experiences. But intellectual visions, unlike imaginative ones, are non-representational. So the first step that I'm suggesting we take is to specify the alleged difference between, or differences between the experience. Okay, but then what? So there's this fascinating section in Augustine's commentary on Genesis, in which um, he's dis where he's discussing the differences be between these kinds of visions, and he picks up on the fact that he includes dreams as one as a subset Ooh. of imaginative visions. And so what I'm going to suggest is that his inclusion of dreams under the heading of imaginative visions points to a next step that would allow us to think about both imaginative and intellectual visions in more contemporary scientific terms. His method was extremely straightforward. He encouraged comparisons with more ordinary phenomena that contain some similar features. As the most common source of imaginative visions, Augustine suggested that we look to dreams for an explanation of how images arise in the context of ecstasy. As he pointed out, however, and I quote, people generally do not care to know about daily occurrences of this more ordinary sort, even though their origin may often be more obscure, because they prefer to gaze in wonder at what is strange and seek the causes of the unusual. Nonetheless, he said, when anyone asked me about the origins of the images of bodies that appear in ecstasy, I in turn asked about the origin of the images that appear daily to the soul in sleep. Okay, so what can we do with this? Because there are allegedly no images or likenesses in an intellectual vision, 
we are allegedly talking about a different sort of experience. We can't make the comparison to dreams. We thus would need to look for a different sort of comparison. And to do that, I had to dig a little deeper into some first-person accounts of what an intellectual vision felt like. And Teresa, who had experiences that she eventually understood as intellectual visions, characterized them as involving an unusual sort of teaching and learning that I think is rather suggestive. She said, the Lord, as a teacher, puts what he wants the soul to know very deeply within it. And there he makes this known without image or words. The soul, she said, in turn, is like, quote, someone who, without having learned or done any work to know how to read, and without having studied anything, would find that all knowledge was possessed inwardly, without knowing how or where it was gotten, since no study had been done, nor even that the ABCs had been learned, unquote. Augustine also alludes to the learning process when he characterizes an uh, this type of vision as intuitions of the intellect and says they can be relied upon because, quote, either it, referring to reason, understands and then it possesses truth, or if it does not possess truth, it fails to understand. From these descriptions, I would like to suggest that the everyday version of an intellectual vision might be an insight or an aha experience that we get or intuit or understand before we can put our understanding into words. But as we all know, we can have an insight, a sense of understanding, and then realize that our understanding is incorrect, that we don't actually really get it. Augustine seems to recognize this problem when he indicates that an intellectual vision is not only, quote, the transparent truth seen without images or any bodily likeness, but that, quote, the vision is darkened by no cloud of false opinion, and the virtues of the soul are not tedious or burdensome. In such a vision, God speaks face to face to him whom he has made worthy of this communion. These caveats suggest the context that supported and authenticated intellectual visions. Thus, not only is an intellectual vision imageless, it is also assumed to be doctrinally correct, transformative, and comes to those who are suitably prepared, i.e. made worthy. This suggests a final step we can take in refining our understanding of unstable concepts. We can identify procedures and criteria that traditions and or disciplines use to cultivate and evaluate such experiences. This would suggest, to summarize some of this, that in order to understand how an intellectual vision works, we would need to understand first how the mind produces imageless insights or aha moments, how different traditions of thought and practice prepare people to have them without seeming to do so, how these traditions decide if such an insight is authentic or true. In the Catholic case, as Poulain readily admits, catechesis, the sacraments, prayer, and various ascetic practices are all presupposed. Moreover, as he noted with regard to hallucinations, Catholic theologians would not consider a vision authentic if it was not congruent with Catholic doctrine and did not result in positive changes in attitudes and behavior. Posed in this more general way, we could also consider the context that supports and assesses scientific insights and intuition. Here, too, value insights and intuitions generally presuppose education in the sciences, practical research experience, and knowledge of various forms of testing and verification. Insights do not arise spontaneously in either case, and in neither case are they accepted uncritically. So, to conclude, 
The focus of this lecture has been on linking humanities with the brain by breaking down a complex cultural concept, in this case ecstasy, into components that I'm thinking psychologists and neuroscientists might be able to study. So here's a summary of those steps. But as this brief reference to the context that support and the procedures used to assess unusual experiences indicates, the complex interactions between individuals, groups, memory, and learning that we take for granted at the behavioral level are mirrored in similarly complicated interactions at the mental and neurological level. I've argued that we can tease apart accounts of experiences that are embedded in and infused with competing assumptions about how the mind works in order to identify components, such as alterations in the sense of self, whose underlying mechanisms can be understood, I'm pretty sure, in time in contemporary uh, psychological and neuroscientific terms. These underlying mechanisms, however, are not enough to account for the formation of the traditions and disciplines that cultivate and evaluate the experiences in question. To understand this, we need to complete the circle by examining the role that certain types of experiences play in the development of traditions and disciplines using the methods which, which, with which we are most familiar in the humanities and social sciences, historical, ethnographic, and textual analysis. And this brings me to a final, and I think rather important point. Linking the humanities with the brain by taking apart complex cultural concepts such as ecstasy allows us to examine the components of the experience and how they work together but doesn't explain what value people have placed on them and what role they've played in human thought and action. It's one thing to take apart a car and figure out how the engine works. It's another thing to understand the varieties of cars and what people do with them. Cars are still cars, even when we understand how they work. Ecstatic experiences in cars differ, however, insofar as there's less debate over what counts as a car than what counts as an ecstatic experience. But those of us in the humanities are well equipped to study the processes whereby disciplines and traditions decide what counts as authentic. We're also well equipped to study the role of authenticated experiences in the development of experiences deemed authentic in the development of traditions and disciplines. Thank you.